Okay, well, I've entitled this Get Your Weave On. Anybody know what a weave is? <laughs> okay, so what we're talking, though, about is weaving our roots, right? Digging down deep with the Lord and interweaving our lives with those around us, those in front of us as well as those behind us. So I love your picture of your daughter, you know, and how you're, you're exactly right. Everybody's not going to be in lockstep with us at all times. Uh, praise God for that too, right? Because we're all individuals. But when we bind our roots together, we are definitely stronger. So earlier we talked about discipleship, becoming a disciple of someone as well as making disciples. And so now we're going to look at what does that look like in real life? So I want to share a little bit about my journey through discipleship and what that's looked like in my life, but I also want to turn back to scripture again and look at a unique story in scripture of two women who were brought together for a very unique time, for a very unique purpose, and what we can learn from their relationship. So as I think back on what discipleship has meant for me, I really learned a lot about it when I was in college. I went to Tennessee and I became instantly involved with um, what was then called Campus Crusade for Christ. Now it's just called Crew. And it played a pivotal role in my life. I got plugged in instantly. I started becoming discipled by a, an, an older student. And she discipled me for about a year. I was in her Bible study and we would meet weekly or every other week, something like that. And with Crew, it's very much an organized system that they use to disciple. And so that was the first year, and then when I was a sophomore and following, I was discipled by one of the crew staff ladies, but I also began eventually to teach Bible studies and to disciple other women. And so it was, for me, a perfect example, and you know, when I started putting all this together, it, it was really beautiful to see how I had an older woman pouring into me, and likewise, even, even before I was really equipped, I went out and I started discipling younger women too beautiful picture. So after I graduated, went on to graduate school, got married, I started teaching Bible studies when we lived out in California and continued that when we moved back east. And I've, I've taught Bible studies, as um, Rachel mentioned earlier, for many, many years. And for me, that was just a wonderful way for me to disciple people, to teach and instruct in God's Word, but also to come alongside them during seasons of life and interweave our roots so that we were supportive of one another. And what I found is not only was I giving to these women, but they were giving right back to me. Even though many of these were younger moms, um, even though I was maybe just a step ahead of them in the mothering process, so I wasn't this old wise woman. I was just barely ahead of them. But I was giving to them. I received so much from them in return. Just an example. My oldest son was 11 years old, playing baseball, and throwing to his best friend in the batting cage. When his friend hit the ball, Graham came out from behind that screen that they stand behind, and he was hit in the head with the baseball. Long story, six days later, he started to deteriorate at school, and uh, they had to call an ambulance. He was rushed to the hospital, stopped breathing in the ambulance. They had to intubate him. And he ended up spending a couple days in ICU and a couple more days in the hospital, had a skull fracture, um, brain bleed, contusion. He was in pretty serious condition. And yet it was during that time that these women I had poured into, our roots were so interwoven, ladies, that I had gifts sent to the hospital. I had gobs of people praying for us, obviously. And meals brought after he came back home. It was just so beautiful to see where I'm giving, but they're giving right back. So even though we have, you know, I think in sometimes with discipleship, we can think we have a hierarchy, but when it comes to the give and the support that's offered, it, there's no hierarchy at all. It's our roots, just like in this beautiful picture. There's no hierarchy. The, the roots are interwoven, right? And it was such a blessing to be able to be a part of the body of Christ and to see the support that was gained as a result. In P.S., he's doing totally fine, had, a, in fact, quite a miraculous 100% um, recovery. But at that same time, it was just so beautiful to see how we were able to come alongside each other in suffering marriages with, you know, parenting struggles, job losses, that sort of thing, and really support one another. 
Then about uh, two, let me think, two and a half years ago, I had been teaching Bible studies nonstop for years, and I really felt the Lord telling me it's time to take a break. And so I asked another woman who I had been discipling, would you fill in for me? I think I need to take a break. And about a month after that, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. So the Lord had, again, just so graciously prepared me to step out, somebody else to step in. He knew I was going to need that break. And so for the next year, I ended up doing more of an accountability group with a couple of women. And again, our roots went down deep. It was a beautiful time to really encourage one another. There was less teaching, if you will, on the teach and talk. There was a lot of talking going on. I don't think that, and we're going to get to the rules of discipleship later, I don't think it always has to look the same. It was not that formalized discipleship that I'd had in college, but it was certainly the beauty of the live oak happening in my life. And they poured into me, and, and I returned the favor. Then several years ago, I began praying when one of those friends asked me, Sarah, who's, who, what older lady is pouring into you? You know, it's interesting because I had seen that I had some older women advising me here and there, but I was doing a lot of giving. And I was getting something back, but I didn't have a woman outside of my mom who was pouring into me as I really felt I needed. And so I began praying, Lord, would you help me find who that can be, who I can connect up with in that sense? And about a year and a half ago, I was speaking at my alma mater, my counseling alma mater in Atlanta, doing a continuing ed event for them. And a lady who was a graduate of there too came up to me afterwards and was really interested in the parenting program I was talking about. Wanted to meet with me. We started meeting. And you guys, have you ever had that situation happen where you start talking to someone and you instantly click? Like, you, you realize you have so many things in common. Now, she could be my mom. She's that much older than me. But the, honestly, the first couple times we got together, we're looking at each other's outfits. We have on almost the same thing. It was just, I mean, the colors, it was just so bizarre. We had this instant connection. And she ended up, I, I was telling her about my book, and she suddenly became my biggest cheerleader and wanted to be a business coach for me. And so I hired her for several months to coach me through the process of getting my business off the ground. And then it kind of morphed after I stopped paying her for that. I thought, well, I may not, you know, talk to her that much. But you know what? She continued that. She saw this as just an investment pouring into a younger woman. And we have continued to have somewhat regular contact. And when you talk about teach and talk, she has done that with me. She has taught me business stuff, but life stuff. We have talked through different family situations that I've come across. Send and process. Jan has done that with me. She has sent me out saying, I want you to try this this week. And then we come back and we talk through it. How'd that go? And then encourage, I mean, again, my biggest cheerleader. And rebuke, she even had a time where she called me up and she said, I need to talk to you about this. I want you to be aware of this. I think you need to be real careful right here. And is that humbling? Yeah, it's humbling. But praise God for people like that. She has been just a beautiful picture to me of what it can look like to be on the receiving end of that once again. And so about, I don't know, maybe a month or so ago, she contacted me and she said, Sarah, you have got to get this book. You, it is right up your alley. You will totally love it because she knows I'm, of course, writing my book and it's on women, right? And so she sent me a picture of this book, Giddy Up Eunice. Anybody heard of this? Anybody familiar with Sophie Hudson or the Boo Mama blog? Anybody? Bueller, Bueller, awesome, one person, sweet. Okay, well I, I want to highly recommend this book to you, Giddy Up Eunice. Um, Sophie Hudson, first of all, is hysterical and I love funny people, I love being around funny people and she writes just like she talks and she goes on five zillion tangents as she's writing too, which are hysterical. She um, is a Southern woman through and through, so if you grew up with Southern sayings and Southern food, she'll tell you all about it. She is really, really fun. But the subtitle is, Because Women Need Each Other. And nothing could be more true than that. Would you not agree that women need each other? Those of you who are married, 
Have you, how long did it take you to figure out that you still needed girlfriends, even though you had the love of your life? Yeah, it didn't take very long, did it? I know my husband um, is a wonderfully patient, I like to talk, can you tell? I mean, it's a good thing I'm a speaker, but I like to talk, and he is wonderfully patient with me, and yet I know there are times when he does not want to hear me anymore. And thankfully, I have girlfriends who will go to lunch with me and let me just ramble and talk and talk. And so I, I believe that God has created women who need women and men need men. And that is a wonderful thing. So anyway, I want to look at a, uh, what, what Sophie does in this book is she looks at three sets of women in Scripture, Mary and Elizabeth and Ruth and Naomi and Lois and Eunice, the mom and grandmom of Timothy. And she looks at each of those sets of pairs of women, an older and a younger, and looks at what discipleship, mentorship look like in Scripture. And so I want to look at Mary and Elizabeth, and some of what I'll cover is some of the stuff that she talks about in the book. She says it a whole lot funnier than I do. Um, but I, I want to add in some other things. I think there's some real good nuggets of truth that we can come away with looking at yet another example from Scripture. So turn, if you will, to Luke 1, and we are going to look through this. Oh, you know, here's another thing about women. And what am I, again, I'm a word girl, right? So one of the words that I love as as a woman and, and really within the context of parenting too is this idea of commiserating with one another. If you think about what that word means, co means with and miserate means being miserable. You know, you be you're you're miserable with somebody. I mean we know what that's like. If you've if you've had children and you find another mom who's at the same stage of life and they commiserate with you. It was so funny, my girlfriend that I met up with yesterday has two teenage sons and my second son just got his driver's license. Well, the process for that in the state of Georgia is they have to take 30 hours of either in-classroom driver's education or online. So since it's like $320 cheaper, we did it online. But um, my son is the master at procrastination, and he literally finished his online education at 1010 a.m., and his driver's appointment was at 10.20 a.m., and it was 30 minutes away. So needless to say, I was a frazzled wreck, and my husband took him. Um, so anyway, I was talking to my friend yesterday, and she said, girl, her son Knox is 15, so he's getting his permit. She said, he did not pass that test. We waited in such and such DMV for three and a half hours, and he did not pass that test. And I told him, I chewed him up one side and down the other, and I told him he was gonna have to ask his dad to take him the next time. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, you're speaking my language. I couldn't handle it either. So yes, we need one another to commiserate with, but not just be miserable together, but to share in the joys and to laugh at the goofiness of life and the challenges of life. And I believe that God is the ultimate connector, the ultimate interweaver. And that often when we're going through something in life, he will plant someone in our life who shares a similar experience. And maybe she's a woman at the same stage of life as we are. And we can commiserate together going through the process. Or maybe she's a little ahead of us. And she's been there, and she knows how to encourage and knows how to rebuke us through that situation. And that's exactly what God did in the situation with Mary and Elizabeth. So let's set the stage first. The Israelites have been anxiously awaiting the voice of God for 400 years. Do you know that between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and Matthew, there were 400 years of silence in which God did not speak to a single prophet to therefore report to his chosen people. Absolute silence from God. Don't you know they were frustrated during that time? Maybe even depressed at times, wondering, has he abandoned us? 
Where is he? We heard the stories that our fathers and mothers told us, but where is he now? And so in many ways, perhaps he could have made some big splashy entrance, and in some ways for one particular priest, he did make a really splashy entrance. As that priest, remember how I was talking about the temple earlier and the once a year, one priest got to go to the Holy of Holies. And in this particular year, that was a man, an old man named Zechariah. Zechariah made that entrance into that Holy of Holy places. He's doing the offerings. And suddenly this angel appears and tells him that he and his old wife are going to bear a son. And he doubts and he's silenced. Isn't that interesting? They've had 400 years of silence. God shows up and he doubts and he's silenced for those next nine months. So his old wife is Elizabeth. And so six months after that appearance, that same angel shows up again. And let's pick up in Luke 1.26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth. We could also call that the backwaters of Israel. Not a real um, up-and-coming kind of place, looked down on by many others in Israel. He was sent to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, in all likelihood, Mary was probably about 14 years old the age of my daughter right now. And that is an overwhelming thought, frankly, (laughs) that God could have chosen a young girl, about 14, a poor girl, a nobody in anybody's list of qualifications from the backwaters of Israel. But he shows up and coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, guess what? Guess what he says? Do not be afraid, right? Because why? She's afraid, and understandably so. For you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, El Elyon. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Can you even imagine what Mary must have felt in those moments? Silence for 400 years. They have been waiting and looking for the Messiah, and now she of all people has been chosen. This must have been overwhelming. And at the same time, she knew she was a virgin. She knew she's engaged. She knew the consequence of showing up pregnant when you're engaged. What was she to do? And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? I mean, that's quite an understatement, right? I don't get it. Notice it's, it's a little different than doubting. She really did not understand. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And what does Mary say in response to this? Behold the bond slave of the Lord. Be it done to me according to your word. This is an astounding story. Gabriel tells Mary just the most bizarre thing is going to happen to her. Something that's never happened before and will never happen again. Something so unbelievable she knows she will potentially be an outcast among her family instantly. And what does God do? He gives her a someone. A someone who has, in some ways, an equally bizarre story. An equally bizarre situation that she's going through, which then allows Mary to believe that this is all going to happen. 
And she submits instantly. And look what she does in response to this. Now at that time, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a city of Judah. No doubt. I mean, she didn't have anybody around her that she could probably really talk to because nobody would believe her that an angel had appeared to her of all people. But she knows somebody who she can find comfort in. And she entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Now we know that John the Baptist, that baby, was already filled with the Holy Spirit. Even in the womb, he had the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. That's a crazy thought too. And in that moment, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed among women are you, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. What an unbelievable sense of encouragement Mary must have had when she feels all absolutely alone. And she goes to Elizabeth. Think about this. She's not even showing. There's no outward appearance yet that Mary is pregnant. And yet upon seeing Elizabeth, Elizabeth instantly knows because of the Holy Spirit that Mary is pregnant, and not just pregnant, but pregnant with the Messiah. What confirmation that must have given Mary that, wow, this really is happening. And I have somebody who's not just, well, okay, but she's like jacked up excited for me. She's going to be my support in that moment. In this time where I feel all alone, God has given me a someone. It's interesting, there's a commentator named Matthew Henry um, from many years ago who said this, the Spirit of God in one woman recognized the Spirit of God in the other. And it was a message from on high to Mary when Elizabeth recognized her as the Messiah's mother. The Spirit of God in one woman recognizing the Spirit of God in another. Have you had that experience? Where you maybe meet somebody for the first time and you're thinking, I think she's a believer. There's some kind of connection between the two of us, and it's the Spirit of God in us that can do that. It had absolutely nothing to do with the age or stage in their lives. Did you notice that? Now, they are both pregnant with miraculous babies, but it had nothing to do with their age. In fact, Elizabeth was more than likely in her 60s, I would say, 50s or 60s, and yet, here's Mary, 14-year-old girl. They don't have a whole, lot of, a whole lot in common in many ways, right? And it would be really easy for Mary to look at Elizabeth and say, she can't relate to me. I mean, I'm a 14-year-old girl. I text all the time. You know, I take selfies. And, you know, she's, she's not going to get it. And Elizabeth could think, oh, these young whippersnappers these days. You know, we had... Have you seen that Facebook meme that says, I had to walk nine feet through shag carpet to change the channel on the TV, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we, we can both look at either age and think, oh, you can't relate to me, or you can't relate to me. And yet that's not what happened in this moment. There was this intense bonding that happened. The question is, are we, as we think about discipling others and being discipled, are we on the lookout for people in our lives? That's what I want to challenge all of us to do, to be on the lookout for people who are already, perhaps, even in our lives, who are at a different stage of life that we can pour into or that we can receive wisdom from. Be on the lookout for that. You know, it's interesting because Titus talks to this very issue. I want you to flip over to Titus 2 and um, see how fast I can find it. Titus talks to this very issue of older women and younger women. Titus 2, 3 to 5. And it says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, that they may encourage, there's that word encourage, young women to love their husbands 
to love their children. Why do we have to be encouraged to love our husbands and love our children? Because apparently it's hard at times. <laughs> to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the, listen to this, that the word of God may not be dishonored. Okay, if you are an older woman, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, the rest, of, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. The rest of you who do not have your hands up, I want you to look around, see if you see somebody who's younger than you. If you see somebody younger than you, go ahead and raise your hand. Right, so all but about two or three of us should have our hands raised. We are all older than someone, and actually all of us should have our hands. Because there, there are high school girls, there are middle school girls who are begging. They may not say it out loud, but they are begging to be discipled by us. They want to know, what, what is, how do I navigate being a woman? What does that look like to follow God? So let me read this again, and now that all of us, sorry, oh wow, now that all of us are older women, let's listen to this again. We are to be reverent in our behavior. That doesn't mean we can't let our hair down, but we need to be reverent in our behavior. Not malicious gossips, that one can sting sometimes, right? Not enslaved to much wine teaching what is good, that we may encourage the young women, you know, the Amplified Bible says to tenderly love their husbands. I read that recently and that hit me in a completely different way because there are times I feel like I love my husband, but do I tenderly love him? Am I kind? That's another one of the words. Am I kind in how I'm talking to him? Or am I thinking, oh, you're grown up, you can handle it. But am I tenderly loving him? Am I loving my children? To be sensible, pure, workers at home. Now, ladies, if we are the older women who are to be teaching these things, then guess what? We need to be doing these things. Being kind, being subject to our own husbands. Again, that the word of God may not be dishonored. Because you know what? When people look at, I, I just heard this uh, was on the radio yesterday as I was getting here. Um, one guy said that, some pastor I was listening to said, sometimes the only Bible that a non-believer will read is your life. And so if my life is reflecting God's word, then when they read my life, they're reading God's word. And I think that's part of what's being said right here, that the word of God may not be dishonored. If my life is reflecting God's word, I am honoring God's word, and people will understand who God is better. So there is value in those of us who are older pouring into those who are younger. And again, it may be someone who is already in your life. In fact, if you look at um, the example of Mary and Elizabeth, they, they were already related. They already knew each other. And so some, t some of you may already have an older relative or a younger relative that you can connect up with and pour into and be poured into. Sophie Hudson says this, the areas where we are wise are meant to intersect with someone else's questions. The areas where someone else is wise are meant to intersect with our questions. And I love that because God will plant someone who has wisdom in your struggles. And it, if you notice too, Mary and Elizabeth don't have a formal discipleship agreement right? Mary doesn't knock on Elizabeth's door and say, hey, I heard you're in a similar situation here. Would you disciple me for the next three months? They have no such formal agreement. She arrives and they begin to have relationship. And here's, here's the interesting thing to me. If, if you think about what, what that could have looked like for them, what do you think those next three months, because Mary stayed for three months, and perhaps she even got to see the birth of John the Baptist. Think about this, the forerunner of her own son. Perhaps she even assisted in that birth. What kind of conversations did they have? What kind of wisdom did Elizabeth give to Mary about being a wife? Elizabeth had been married a long time by then. Mary's about to get married. What kind of nuggets of truth do you think that Elizabeth imparted to Mary that months and months later, Mary recalled 
and found encouragement from. So here's the deal. The other thing that I think is really cool to think about when, when you look at this story of Mary and Elizabeth is nowhere in there is Elizabeth in any way hindered or put off by the fact that this young girl is going to be the mother of the Savior of the world. There's no sense of competition between the two of them. And so at some point, you may be discipling a young woman who becomes in the Christian world maybe somewhat of a rock star or has some position of great authority and influence. Don't let that hinder your ability to disciple her. You have your mission. God has a mission for those you disciple or those who are your disciplers. You are not called to complete her mission and she's not called to complete yours. Um, there's, a, there's a quote, what rising tides raise all boats. So in that, in that sense, if we are living out the mission that God has called us to, then praise him. He's called you to your specific mission. And I love that, that Elizabeth wasn't put off by that. She wasn't jealous that Mary got to be the Savior's mom. Instead, she blessed her. She encouraged her in that. So what are the women, who are the women who are already in your life? Do you have women in your life who are both younger and older than you? And if you don't, then maybe you need to ask somebody to coffee. Ask them to go out to lunch. Just start hanging out with them. So I want to look at what are some rules, if you will, for discipleship. What are some tips of what that can look like? Now, I told you earlier that when I was involved with Crew, it was somewhat systematic, the way that they did their discipleship program. But I will say this, the first rule is there are no rules. <laughs> there are no specific tep steps that you have to take to be in a discipleship relationship. It, again, going back to Mary and Martha, it may look different depending on who you're discipling. Some of you may like more systematic things, great, go, go for it. Some of you may realize that you'd rather meet for coffee and do a lot of the talking about life, right? with some teaching thrown in there. It may look like you meeting up on the baseball field before your kids' games with someone you're discipling. It's gonna look different. But number two, find someone you enjoy and really like. I mean, and, and if you can throw in some laughter, do it. It's important for us to enjoy being together, and that's one thing that I love about Jan, the lady I dis or who disciples me, is we really have fun together. We are at very different stages of life. She's a grandmother, and I'm launching my kids here soon. But we totally enjoy being together. Have regular contact, not rigid. Regular contact, but not rigid. And then I want you to think about this. If you're wondering, I have no idea who to disciple. I have no idea how to be discipled. I want you to think about your spiritual gifts. Have you guys talked at your church much about spiritual gifts? So I'm seeing some nodding of heads. Some people are familiar with that. So there are obviously whole Bible studies you can do and tests that you can take to figure out what your spiritual gifts are. But let me just go over a couple of them because in your small groups in a little bit, you're going to be talking through some of these things. So for instance, there's the gift of service. Now service can look very different. But some people serve by helping out with the children's programs, right? Some people serve by making bulletins and folding them and handing out things. Some people serve by greeting. I do hospitality committee at my church, so I greet at the front doors when people come in. Right? There are all different ways to serve. Start looking around the people that you serve with if you have that servant's heart, that servant gift. And start connecting with those people. And maybe you start discipling one of those individuals, and then you encourage that person to go out and try service in, an other, in another area. Find out what her passion is and how you can send and process that. Right? That's an example with service. Teaching, that's one of my gifts. And so with teaching, when I lead Bible studies, I try to have somebody that I'm helping to mentor, to, to encourage in that arena as well, and so when I am gone, I'm out of town or sick or whatever, I have that person fill in for me. 
and then we process it. And I've had a couple women realize, you know what, that's not my gift. That's not, that's not their thing. That's equally as important as knowing what your gift is, what is not your gift. You don't need to feel um, pressured to be doing something that's not your giftedness. So those are a couple of examples of how you can use your gift to try to find people to disciple as well. Next one, you are not there to change someone or to control someone. <laughs> Discipleship is just like these trees. We're interweaving our lives, but it's not to raise another child. Not that we can control our children either. Anyone? <laughs> I mean, we, we are there to come alongside and to encourage and to occasionally rebuke, but we are not to try to control them. And that flows right into this next thought about grace, grace, and more grace. If we are too heavy-handed on the rebuking side of things, we may find that eventually we don't have anyone to encourage anymore. When we open ourselves up in a discipleship relationship and we're pouring our guts out to someone, we don't need that other person to trample all over them. That's where we really need grace and encouragement. And so I think we need to just be real cautious. You know, a lot of you, I'm sure most of you, that's not at all an issue. Um, most of us, I, I think, have a difficult time confronting someone and rebuking someone. And yet, that's, that's kind of the mentality that we want to take, is grace, grace, and more grace. Now last, I want to go over a couple of examples that I've seen of how this looks in real life. At my church, we are big into discipleship and community groups, that sort of thing. And it was probably 25 or 30 years, probably 25 years ago at our church that this program started that we now call LUG, Living Under Grace. It's our middle school program. And it's where our high school kids mentor and disciple our middle school kids on Wednesday nights. So we have a middle school pastor who gets up and teaches the lesson, and then they divide up into small groups, and the high, schools, high school kids are leading those small groups. Now we have adults who participate in that. They're called the lug adults. But they are there more as a supportive type person. They are not there to be the teacher, the instructor, anything like that. They are there you know, for correction if something kind of goes off the rails. But I love that idea that from a young age, it's the older pouring into the younger. And it's just been a beautiful model. Now, we also have, like I said, a lot of community groups. And here's, here's something that you can be thinking about. We even have a community group for those people who like to go bike riding. So it's a group who just gets together, they ride bikes together, they interweave their lives together. And guess what? If you even start something like that, or we have a knitting group too, believe it or not, and those women get together and they knit uh, baby blankets and socks and those sorts of things for pregnancy, crisis pregnancy centers. But there's a great way to connect people who have similar interests, somebody you're going to like in that sense, and you start interweaving your life with someone. Maybe you start up some kind of group. Maybe you really are into baking like I am. And maybe you start a class where you teach people how to bake. You older ladies who have skills that have been lost in my generation and generations below me, start a class like that. There are women who want to know how to do some of those things that you know how to do. And what a beautiful opportunity to then be able to give back and pour into someone who you know wants to be with you in that sense. We also have, this is really cool, not far outside of Atlanta, one of the suburbs is a city called Clarkston, Georgia. And that is a location where a lot of refugees who are brought into the United States are relocated when they first come here. And so within, I think it's a one square mile, there are more nationalities there in that one square mile than in anywhere else in the United States. It is an amazing place. And so our high schoolers and middle schoolers during the summer go there to the different apartment complexes. They play with the kids and then they tell the kids about Jesus. And you wouldn't believe, it's so cool to see the pictures from that because those kids get crazy excited when the buses pull up and our kids get off. 
It is just such a neat way to interweave lives right there. But our church has gone a little bit above and beyond that, and we just recently, actually last week, closed on a house down there that is essentially a community center. And we have an organization that now meets there called Peace of Thread, P-E-A-C-E, Peace of Thread. You can go online probably and look them up. It is so cool, ladies, because a lot of these refugee ladies have no way to support, no skills to support their families and to bring in income. And so what Peace of Thread does is they train these women in how to make gorgeous designer handbags with just absolutely fabulous fabrics. And they are top notch bags, messenger bags, Bible covers, wallets, and so forth, so that those women can now earn a living. And so these are Muslim women, Hindu women, who have come to the United States, and they are being mentored by Christian women who are pouring into, one of those women recently was in the hospital, seriously ill, nearly died, and we had women from our church loving all over her and her family during that time. That is discipleship. We have another project there, it's called Project Lantern, and it's for the men. So it's businessmen teaching skills to these refugee men who may have come with you know, one kind of skill that worked in their country, but they get here and they can't provide for their families. So those are the kinds of things I want you to be thinking about. What can you even start in your own community to reach out to the lost? Because we need to be sharing Christ with the lost, not just within you know, not just discipling up young believers in our own community, but how can you also reach out to the lost? You could start a book club. That's another idea that I, I'm considering doing in my neighborhood with the women and opening it up to all women, lost and followers of Jesus. And then obviously doing a Bible study like I'll be starting up again, teaching Bible study in about a week or two, and using that opportunity to teach, but also to disciple. So I've, I've thrown a lot at you. I, I hope your brain is starting to churn a little bit, thinking about where do my gifts um, merge with people I know and how might I step outside my comfort zone and reach out to a lady that I want to get to know, that I want to be discipled by, how important that is so that we can get our weave on and we can interlock our roots with somebody else. So you guys are, again, going to go to your small groups, talk through some questions, about some of these things. Hopefully that'll be a blessing to you, but let me pray for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us each other, that we are not alone. You are with us as Emmanuel, but you've also given us flesh and blood, friends, women who can love on us and encourage us, rebuke us, teach us, send and process with us. Father, would you just shine a light over the heads of the women that we each need to be involved with? Show us how we need to increase discipleship in our communities, how we need to reach out to the lost outside of our churches, how we can use creative ways to do that. And I thank you that you are going before us. You, are, uh, you have created us for good works, and you are going to see that through to fruition. We praise you for being our God. We praise you for salvation and for the abundant life that you have given to us. May we walk in a manner worthy of you. In Jesus' name, amen.